In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. We're all familiar with today's Gospel, right? From Luke 5. Our Lord Jesus Christ uh, comes by the boat of St. Peter. There's a big crowd. He tells him to let out a little bit, and uh, away from the shore, he gets into the boat, and he begins to talk to the people. And after that, he tells St. Peter, uh, launch into the deep, and let down your net for a catch. And St. Peter tells him, you know, Lord, we've told all night and like caught nothing, but at your word, we'll do it. And you know the rest of the story, they caught the fish and, and so on. Um, one thing I was thinking about, I was reading, is that St. Peter could have come up with all kinds of objections. And not just that we've worked all night, but all kinds of stuff. Like, you know, for example, the fish are by the shallows, not by the deep. Or it's daytime now, the fish are gone. Or like, I've been a fisherman all my life, and you know, son of a fisherman, son of a fisherman, like, you know, what do you know? You're, you're a carpenter, right? Um, or you're a stranger, like, what do you know? I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm doing. Or I've tried this many times, you know, going into the deep just to try my luck, and it didn't work before. So what do you know? What are you talking about? Um, all kinds of objections, but one of the objections that I bet you didn't think or imagine St. Peter could say is, okay, Lord, get with me into the boat, and we'll go out there, and I want you first to show me the fish right there at the surface of the water, and then I will let down my nets. Would make sense, right? I'd be like, what are you talking about? That's crazy. Um, the interesting thing is that we do this with God all the time. We do this with God all the time, believe me. First, we tell him, show me the results, and then I will let down my net. We tell him, first, show me the fruit, and then I will plant the seed. Does that make any sense? It's nonsense, and yet we do it with God every day. St. Peter didn't do any of this. He trusted the Lord and went back with him, and after washing the nets and you know working all day and all that stuff, and then, and only then, after he let down the nets in deep water where he could not see anything under the surface, did the fish come up. Only after he's done that. Um, so I was thinking about uh, basically some of the examples of things that we can do that where we first need to let down our nets and then we come up with a catch. For example, the catch of belonging and understanding. I'm going to go through them really quickly. Imagine this conversation, which should never happen because it doesn't make any sense, but unfortunately it happens all too often, okay? Abuna talks to a person, hi Habibi, how are you? Why don't you come to church? The person responds, I don't feel like I belong. Let that soak in for a minute. How are you going to belong if you don't come? Which one comes first? Why do you think you will belong if you're not involved, if you don't come? And yet many of us do that. I want to somehow feel like I belong and then I'll come. And we fool ourselves and we accept these lame excuses, these ridiculous excuses thinking that it's okay. First I want to belong. Or another one, why don't you come to church? Well, I don't understand what's going on. Okay, did you ask? First you need to come. First you need to go, what is this? What are they doing? What does this mean? Come talk to Abuna, talk to the servant, ask for a book. There's like a gajillion YouTube videos that explain everything. But somehow I want to understand what's going on and then I'll go? How? No. First, first you need to let down your net and come regularly, consistently, on time. And then and only then you'll begin to feel like you belong. And not from the first time. You have to do that regularly and consistently and then you'll feel, you feel like belong. And when you come, ask, what does this mean? Why does Abuna do that? I mean, what a great topic to talk about when we're out there having coffee, right? As opposed to all the other, the other stuff is fine. But I'm talking about the things we could talk about and we, we waste the opportunities. Another catch is the catch of becoming Christ-like. We all want to be saints. We all want to be wiser, we want to be better, we want to be calmer, we want to be more loving. We want to be Christ-like images walking around that people can see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. We all want this, we sincerely want this, right? But a few of us are willing to trust and to invest into a regular consistent spiritual canon 
and to spend that time with God so that you can begin to understand God. All the different things that we talk about all the time, prayer, Bible, confession, communion, liturgies, Bible studies, spiritual books, sermons, keeping company with the saints, avoiding company with carnal people. Um, how am I going to be like God if I don't spend time with God? It's not going to happen. Um, it's not going to happen. And to do so regularly and consistently, and not just to do it once or twice and then be done with it. No, you have to, you know, let down your net and then see what happens. How on earth are you going to have a chance of becoming more and more Christ-like if you don't trust and let down your net of regularly and consistently keeping company with God and keeping your spiritual feeding? It will not happen. Keep wishing all day long until you, you know, all the rest of your life. It's not going to happen. Sorry for the disappointment. The catch of peace. Some of us have ongoing animosity from co-workers, from acquaintances, um, from even some family members. And those, those animosities and problems and struggles can last for a lifetime. God tells us, okay, no problem. You want a big catch of peace? First, you go let down your net and Proverbs 15.1, give a gentle answer to turn away wrath. Did I try that? No. First, they have to be good to me and nice to me and whatever, and then I'll give them a, a nice answer. Is they? How? It's not going to happen. Or like Romans 12, 17 to 20 says, Repay no one evil for evil. Do not avenge yourselves. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. First, do this. Trust, no, not, not trust me, trust God. First do this, and then watch the peace just reign in over you. Huge catch of peace, where you're going to have to, it's going to ooze over, and then affect all those around you, and get the other ships to fill out with the peace. First, let down your net of loving your enemy, first. And then you'll get a catch of winning them over as friends, and a great catch of peace. Launch the net of forgiveness. Some people wonder why they have anger, why they are irritable, why do they snap at people, why do they have a hard time sleeping at night, why do they get so irritated when they see some other people really extra successful or extra happy or their kids are flourishing, why are they isolated from some people. All this stuff are results of unforgiveness. All of those. And then they either don't realize or really know, but they refuse because they're stubborn to first launch into the deep and cast that net of forgiveness. And, and they ignore God's warning saying, don't let the sun go down on your anger and give the devil a foothold in your life. We, we demand that things go in the order that I want, but logically, mathematically, it's not going to happen. Take Christianity out of it. It's not going to happen. Why do you think God is giving us all these commandments? It's so that we can launch into the deep first and taste and see the result of listening to Him. <clears throat> if you want to fly, you must first forgive because forgiveness tethers you to the person or to the people that you are unforgiving to them. What do people do? No. First, they have to come to me and apologize and then I'll forgive. First, they have to come and be nice to me, and then I will forgive. How on earth are they going to see you going to see that fruit if you don't proceed and let down your net first and plant that seed and extend that olive branch and to keep doing it regularly? It's not going to happen otherwise. Launch the net of giving. Many people tell themselves and lie to themselves, saying, "Tomorrow, when I have more." I will begin to give. Tomorrow when I have more, I will begin to give. And alas, tomorrow never comes. And, and the interesting thing is that even after some time when they do have more, they don't feel like they have more because they've gotten accustomed to this. So it's like, okay, tomorrow when I have more, I will give. And it never comes. Um, we're all familiar with this verse, Malachi 3.10. Bring the whole tithe in to my house and try me now, says the Lord of hosts. If I do not, look at what happens. If I do not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows and there is no room enough to receive it. 
either you will literally get more, or, just to clarify, we're not preaching prosperity gospels here, or what you have will last you as if you have a lot more, or you will feel so satisfied and content and at peace and not stressing over money and like that things are somehow working out great if you do this. But first, you have to let down the net. We read this all the time. Luke 6, 38 from the Sermon on the Mount says, Give. It says that when first. First, give. First, let down the net of giving. Then, it will be given to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. What do we want? No, first give me a good measure, pressed down, shaken, put it in my bosom, and then I will think about giving. It's not going to happen. First, you need to, first, to launch the net first. This is the last one. The catch of a happy home and healthy children. <clears throat> This is a part of the Pauline written in the crowning ceremonies in Ephesians 5. It concludes with this. Each husband is to love his own wife the same as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. I kind of giggle when I see that, like, these new, like, news bulletins and articles about how this incredible research that came out and discovered, for example, like this one, like, the number one need for a man is to be respected. And the number one, after tons of research and interviewing and researching and checking with like thousands of people, the number one need for a woman is to be loved. Now we all need love, we all need respect, we all need all this kind of stuff, but the most important one, the one that feeds them the most is this. And I giggle because like, oh yeah, God told us that thousands of years ago, if only you knew. Um, look at what happens, unfortunately, all too frequently. Many of us do this. First, she must respect me, and then I will love her. Or she says, first, he must love me, and then I will respect him. And then what? Dead luck. He's waiting on her, she's waiting on him, year after year, decade after, you know, just misery after misery. No, remember, in Ephesians 5, it says you must love her as Christ loved the church, period. There's no as long as or unless she doesn't deserve it, or until she, no. You do that. Try that. First, <clears throat> let down the net of loving her, even if she doesn't respect you. And you first let down the net of respecting him, even if he doesn't love you, and watch the catch. Then you will get that catch, that rare catch of a peaceful, happy home where people are happy to go back to and emotionally healthy children. People are surprised sometimes when I tell them this, but the best gift you can give your children is that mom and dad are friends. It's not let's pray together, it's not let's read the Bible together, it's not none of that. Mom and dad are friends. And bring them regularly to church. When they hear the stuff that they hear in the sermons and in the Sunday schools, and then they go home and they see that mom and dad are applying this, it's like it nails it into their mind. This is what Christianity is. There are other households where like there's the house is full of icons more than the church, you know, CTB or Agape are playing all the time and like God this, God that, pray this, pray that, which are all wonderful. But then mom and dad aren't friends. They're doing this deadlock thing. What happens? Like it's uh, Christianity, this baloney, and you know, nobody's applying anything. Forget about this. And, and it actually works against what the church is teaching them. So first let down the net and then you'll get that great catch. Um, it's a very simple concept. And actually, by the way, we do it all the time. We do this all the time. Or first letting out down our net. I'll give you some quick examples. In college, we first let down a net and pay a ton of money, and we endure for years, for many people, it's a lot of years, expecting, kind of hoping, or like trusting that at the end of this, they will have prepared me to be able to be marketable, to get a good job. First, we let down our net. We don't tell them, I want the job offer, and then I'll go to college. But we do that. Or with a coach or a physical trainer, we let them abuse us, right? Not from personal experience, of course. But we let them, you know, run more, carry heavier, do this, stop eating, you know, all this stuff. Trusting that at the end of this, 
painful journey, I'm going to be healthier, stronger, live longer, avoid certain ailments when I'm older, and all that kind of stuff. Doctors, we trust that when they tell us, take this medicine, and in some cases it's poison. If I take too much of it, it'll kill me, and then that will fix me. That will make me better. With surgeons, we let them put us to sleep, completely surrender to them, and hoping or trusting that they're going to cut the right parts off, <laughs> or, you know, close the right things, or fix the right things, or whatever. We do this all the time. Some people do it even with a magazine, for goodness sake. The magazines nowadays, I don't know, like digital magazines, like they read some article, whatever, and they just, okay, I launch my net, let's see what happens. We do this all the time and every day, but alas, not with God, which doesn't make any sense. And now look at the life of St. Peter and all his buddies afterwards. It wasn't just a catch of fish that solved their problems and their resources and their families are now able to eat. But it just goes way beyond that. The blessing of um, their faith being so much stronger and so real to the point that they happily and lovingly give up their life for this with uttermost peace and joy knowing what's waiting for them. The blessing of being selected as apostles and servants of God. The blessing of being entrusted of so much more. The blessing of a most wonderful adventure for the rest of their lives to the point where they left everything because now they see because first they let down their net the blessing of seeing God at work almost every day of their life even after his resurrection and ascension first let down your net and then you will have that catch if you don't do it this order you'll never have a catch may God help us to trust him enough to let down our nets for a great catch, and glory be to God forever and ever. Amen.